wanted to get started again. Uh, it's okay to have food and drink in here, but please be really careful with the drink and let's not spill it because the poor maintenance guys have a terrible time cleaning that up. You know, the room's tough to get mops and stuff in. So be attentive to your drink, okay? Uh, all right. <laughs> This is called a projectile. Um, it's a complication because it's something we call two-dimensional motion. So up till now, everything we've looked at has kind of moved in a straight line. This object is moving in a curved path that we could not put on a straight line. We need a sheet of paper, something with length and width, okay, or in this case, length and height. So this projectile motion is a challenge because the question would be, is there any way for me to figure out this more complicated situation based on the relatively simple one-dimensional stuff that I now know? Well, that's a problem we face in math and science all the time. And there are a number of approaches to, you know, how do I move to the next level? But one of them is to say, is it possible to reduce the complicated problem into a couple of simple problems. And in this instance, we're going to suggest how that might go. Is it possible to think about this two-dimensional motion as a combination of one-dimensional motion going one way and one-dimensional motion going the other way? If that's the case, it would mean that what I do in one direction is independent and acts alone, and I can analyze it. And what I do in the other direction is independent, acts alone, and I can analyze it. There's a very interesting problem in physics that enunciates that question. We suggest that we're going to go to Kansas, where the ground is completely flat, terribly boring. I'm going to take a pistol, and I'm going to Kansas so that there's nothing the pistol can do except shoot a bullet, okay? <laughs> and I'm going to bring a stone. I'm going to stand in this huge empty field. I'm going to point the gun horizontally. I'm going to put a stone right next to the barrel of the gun, and I'm going to fire the gun and let go of the stone at exactly the same time. Which hits the ground first, the bullet or the stone? Yes, sir? Um, they hit the ground. Bullets going so much faster. This stone will because the gun it goes into a s it goes straight, so the stone will have gone um to the ground first. Okay, so the, 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 you, you figured the, the thing that I just dropped is going to hit. Mm -hmm. Okay? And you were saying? I think the same time. Cause then it doesn't matter like how fast it goes, it's going to stay too cool. I'm not sure. Really. <laughs> I think the stone because it has more mass. Stone has more mass, okay? So heavy objects fall faster? Mm -hmm. oh. We want to test these hypotheses, right? The heavy object falls faster hypothesis. My, the first place I apply that to is Olympic diving, where the bathing suits weigh a lot less than the divers. Wouldn't that be a much more interesting sport if heavy objects fell faster? Okay. So, as with almost any scientific question, ultimately we've got to try it out. Okay? So, 
It seems to be frowned on to bring guns into class. I know. We've got this spring gun. I can cock the spring. I've got a ball bearing that I can place here. We're going to fire this ball bearing sideways. I have another ball bearing with a hole in it. It slides on the end of this plunger. So as the plunger comes out, it's released because we can't trust the reflexes of an old man. There's not a snowball's chance I can fire this and drop something at the same time. But the machine can do that. So we're going to fire this, the ball gets fired, the ball gets dropped at the same time. Because it's a big room and some of you are pretty far away, we put metal plates down on the ground so that you become the scientific instrument. You're going to be listening. The folks over here have very good access to this, and of course, if we hear two different hits, the question is which was which, okay, but you guys probably can tell whether this was the first. Okay, meanwhile, you guys over here probably have first access to this, and maybe you can corroborate that. So, let's see what happens when we release it. Did we hear two hits? We heard one hit. Is it possible that guy who said it was going to land together was right? Yes. in high school where guys did science and, and ladies as well did and you know we gotta be fair to the ladies the ladies were just as bad at science fair projects as the men it was definitely equality there um, but what they were doing was one experiment like they got it to work once I mean, this is like winning the lottery that, that isn't a life plan it, you know you win the lottery one day you don't say well okay that's how I'm going to do I'm going to win the lottery every time I need money. Okay? No, no, no. So we've got to do it a few times and see if this thing really is something we can count on. So let's try this again. Single hit. What does this mean? Well, it means that we can break this complicated problem into two simple problems. It means that if I am falling vertically, Gravity does its thing whether I'm moving sideways or not. So it means that if I drop a ball from here, it's going to fall, and if I shoot this ball, it's going to fall at the same rate, although while it's falling, it just happens to be moving sideways. So if I take a picture every hundredth of a second, the thing that I fired, okay, whether that's water coming off the waterfall, whether it's Thelma and Louise in their car driving off the Grand Canyon, okay, this thing is going to go across. If I were on a planet with no, uh, if, you know, if we could turn gravity off, inertia would be the case and it would follow a straight line. Tick, 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 tick. If gravity's in here, gravity says lower, 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 and notice we're picking up speed faster, we get a curved path. Now, that's the simplest case of firing horizontally. What if we tilt this thing? Now, if we tilt this, something very interesting happens. The shape that we had before is half a parabola. When we tilt it, the same setup gives me the full parabola, which is a kind of a neat shape. This, of course, is something to study in math class. But once again, critically important. It turns out that our early analysis can apply even to this more complicated case. If we had no gravity and we fired this, it would follow that straight line. But each of these strings shows me how much gravity will displace the path by the time I've gone this far. And so I continue to have this path. And so if that's the case, and we've worked very hard on the appearances here, we've used gaudy pink balls to mark the path, and we have a neon yellow ball to actually track. And so we can set that, am I going to hit? Okay, and so, 
Let's try again. And even if we don't land in the bucket, I think you can see that the path is the one that we can think about. Uh, one of the problems is I have ordered the anti-gravity machine and it hasn't come yet. But if we could turn the gravity off, we could actually have the ball follow the straight line. So, we can analyze the simple idea of firing horizontally, and we can see that by tilting it, that analysis can actually be transferred to the more complicated problem of firing at an angle. We should point out that the mathematics here is a bit challenging, and at the Moore School of Electrical Engineering, when they built the first computer in 1946, the first thing they did with it was calculate trajectory problems. Because it was the end of World War II, and uh, the gunnery officers who were using the cannons in the war uh, needed some help doing their math. And uh, the computer did it. So now that we understand the basic principles, Pete is going to show us one of the absolute classic problems of introductory physics. So, I think that this is one of the classic problems because it has one of the best names of a problem. It is the monkey hunter problem. So, Bobby, take the picture. We have a hunter who is out in the jungle trying to shoot a monkey. Aww. And yes, it's a really cute, cuddly monkey. Because that is what hunters do. They try to shoot animals. Now, the monkey, the monkey is very flighty. So, when the hunter fires the gun, there will be a loud bang. This bang will startle the monkey, and the monkey will let go of the tree and start falling out of the tree. The hunter, being an experienced hunter, knows that the monkey will do this. So, the question is, where does the hunter need to aim to hit the monkey if the monkey will start to fall as soon as the bullet leaves the gun? Now, from what we have just covered, you should have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen here. So, I'm just going to run it once, and then we can discuss what happens. Now, this is our wonderful hunting rifle. As you can see here, at the end of the rifle is this switch. This switch works this electromagnet. <laughs> so, when the bullet leaves the gun, the monkey will start to fall. Now, none of us really want to shoot a monkey. I do. <laughs> so, so, instead of an endangered animal, we'll just switch to a stick <laughs> Shoot to where I know the target's going to be. 
you were trying to aim somewhere where it scared Barney for him to let go of the tree? Well, he's going to let go if he doesn't allow a bang. Right? He's going to let go no matter where I'm aiming. If I shoot a flare gun, Barney's going to go. He's kind of a coward. <laughs> so, so, we have maybe above the target, maybe below the target, maybe at the target. Well, the answer, as we can see from our wonderful diagram from before, is I can aim directly at the target. Now, what's particularly interesting here is the speed of the bullet doesn't matter. As long as I shoot fast enough that it will reach the target before it hits the ground, no matter how fast the bullet's going, the bullet is going to start falling the exact same time that the target falls. So as long as it can span the distance to the target, I should be able to hit every time. You wrote it? So, even if I shoot slower, now, I do want to point now, some of you may be wondering, if it's this easy to shoot a target, why is this an Olympic sport? <laughs> oh, yeah. The answer is, this is probably the simplest way we could do this problem, which is why it's the one you find in your introductory physics textbook. It's very easy to imagine, what if the target doesn't hear the shot, and I'm now aiming up at a tree? What if the target hears me lift the rifle, and is already falling by the time that I shoot? Right? It's very easy to see how this simple problem can very quickly become a much more complicated problem. Which is why, with just a couple levels of complication thrown on this, you're literally a rocket scientist shooting things in Mars, and it takes that much effort and energy to figure it out. So this has been projectile motion. Right? Now we're going to switch to another form of slightly more complex motion called oscillation. So 
We get the change by putting a minus sign in. The force is proportional to the opposite of the motion. F is proportional to negative x, or if you're aware of the, the way the math works, if I have a mass proportionality, there's a constant. And so th this behavior is described by the equation F equals negative kx. So I, I make a move here, the force tries to make me go there. I make a move here, the force tries to make me go there. If I let it go on its own, that happens. And so we've now got this oscillation because the force keeps turning around and undoing what the motion does. This is the easiest way to have this happen. It's like Pete said, it looks a little complicated, but it's as simple as it gets for this behavior. So we call this simple harmonic motion. We can have it happen in the case of a spring. We can also have it happen in the case of a pendulum. Now there's no spring in a pendulum. We move the pendulum left. Why does it want to go back to the center? Because it isn't just moving to the, well, what, to your right. It's also going up. So in both cases, we are storing energy. There is a potential energy. Because I go over and up, which means I've now got gravitational potential energy. This wants to go down and pick up speed. It does so by swinging back and forth. Here I have elastic potential energy. I put energy into the spring. That is now a potential, which means it's got the possibility of getting me to move. And this bounces back and forth. So we've got both of these behaviors. There are a few other ways to have this happen, but most commonly it happens either in the case of a pendulum or a spring. Notice that in each of these situations, the timing is very repeatable. It just keeps doing the same thing. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. These are small examples. This is a big room. We would like to make things large enough that you folks in the back. And since things are going to be a little bit larger, we need to be a little extra careful with some of this. Now, what's also interesting 
since this guy, the length of time this guy takes to swing is based on the length of the wire that it's mounted on. But if we have several pendulums, each with a different length, each of them will swing for a different amount of time per swing. And if we get enough of them, we can see some interesting stuff. So these pendula, we've got nine pendulums. Here's a short one on the video. You can see here's the front guy right here. If I give it a swing, notice it goes back and forth a lot faster than the one that Pete was just using. This one over here is a much longer string, and I let it go. And notice that the near one does two or three swings for every swing of the far one. Now, the lengths of these pendulums have been carefully arranged so that they are multiples of one another, which means that the time it takes them to go back and forth will be an even count by carefully choosing them, they start out in phase, which means they're all together, and then of course the fast guys get ahead, but after you've gotten ahead by a whole swing, you're back to being matched up again. Okay? So, Brian has practiced assiduously of getting these guys to release at the same time. practice we're losing energy by flexing the string by moving air. So, you know, they, they run out of energy very slowly and we get multiple cycles out of it. But it's quite clear that the length of the pendulum has a lot to do with the time that it takes for them to move.
Okay? When I'm in the middle, it's off. And so we've actually got the uh, conditions that produce simple harmonic motion. So this moves up and down. The equilibrium position, if I come to a halt, this guy just says, not much is happening. Okay? And then we have to, un unlike a dumb hunk of metal, I can put energy into the system, right? So I'm a, a rather uh, energetic and smart man. Okay? Um, please notice that, like Pete's pendulum, okay, this has a very specific period. The period of the spring mass system depends on how stiff the spring is and how massive the object is, because remember, What's the mass about? It's inertia. So my body doesn't want to change what it's doing. In outer space, the astronauts have a real problem. It's weightless, their muscles don't work much, and their muscles atrophy. So they want to find out how much muscle is, is the astronaut losing. Well, on Earth, you would just weigh yourself, but they're weightless. So they get on a scale that reads zero. How do you find out? They've got a double spring system that they put these guys in the middle of, and they do this with them. They bounce them up and down and time them. And of course, if they're getting lighter, they have less inertia, and what happens? They, they bounce faster. In other words, a small mass is easier to turn around. And so you don't lose weight, you lose seconds. And so as the astronaut loses seconds, they know that their muscles are getting weaker, and they've got to use their elastic strap exercise is a little better. So the next question is, what is the path of my motion? How does it map out? Now, if this were, you know, the time of Isaac Newton, or even if this were the first half of the 20th century, we couldn't do this electronically. We'd have to do it mechanically. And so somebody would hand me a crayon, and Brian and Pete would walk behind me with a big sheet of shelf paper, and I would map out what I'm doing. And they would carefully walk at one meter a second, and we'd get a graph of position versus time. But we can do that electronically now. This is a motion detector. In your physics class, you may have used these. They send out an ultrasonic chirp. <coughs> they listen for an echo. The computer times the time. We know how fast sound is, so we know how far away this is. So I'm sure you've used this, but I doubt you've used it to measure where your ass is. Okay. Okay. We're going to keep track of everybody. Okay. Checking out, the and we're going to see how does this map out on the screen. Okay. And so, so we end up with this gorgeous sine wave, and so I can actually map that out by moving up and down. Okay, but this is an interesting shape. There are a lot of ways to move up and down, the simplest of which would be triangles. So I would just go up with a diagonal line until I hit something and I'd bounce off like a ball on the ceiling, and then I'd come down at a steady speed and bounce off the ground. That would be really uncomfortable. This actually isn't bad, it's kind of fun. Um, but it's that because so there, it rounds out at the top. So as I go up, I lose speed gradually and come to a stop, and then I pick up speed gradually. I'm going fast across the middle, but pretty slow at the end. This is a sine wave, okay? It's also, if you know trig, a cosine wave that we shift a little bit, okay? But this is the fingerprint of simple harmonic motion. Most objects in nature that vibrate, vibrate this way because they've all got springs and masses. And that the springiness may just come from the electrical forces between atoms. And there's that attraction that can bounce back and forth. And so this works at every level. You know, it's a watch spring in your watch, or it's a teacher hanging from a garage door spring. And it all happens the same way. Now I have to try to get off. <laughs> this is thrilling. This is a real. Yeah, this is a <laughs> What, what I have to point over is that the guy who does the demonstrations is the guy who learns the most physics. Because, of course, it's really important to learn the physics if you die when you don't learn it. Okay? So, so first you have to make sure that no clothes or body parts are caught in the screen. And I have to get rid of that 
energy gradually. Because if I don't, when I get off, the spring launches into the air and launches me into the air. <laughs> The elastic, the springiness of this is capable of making it bounce back and forth 440 times a second. When it does, it pushes on air. These forks are pretty small, they don't move much air, so we attach it to a wooden box. The whole box shakes and all that air moves. And that means everybody can hear it. Okay? Now, we've got another one. Okay? A newer one. Doesn't look as beat up, doesn't look like it would sell for as much on eBay. Those antiques go a lot, you know, and we're careful not to paint it because Antiques Roadshow would say, oh, it would have been worth a million dollars if you didn't paint it. Okay, but so we keep it that way. It's pretty, pretty much the same note. All right, turns out that there's very little energy there, but it can only go at one rate. That means that this object is very ready to accept energy at that rate. So ready, in fact, that if I put these two guys together, oh, oh. this one now, I didn't hit it. How did it start vibrating? Am I creating energy? Does it work the other way? Be careful to hear it. on that hunk of metal. Well, it's terribly important to remember 440 cycles a second. 440 times a second, those air molecules go that way and then go this way. Not much energy in them, but 440 times that tiny amount of energy every second. It gets the box vibrating, it starts to get this vibrating. This is not unlike what happens when a little kid pushes their parents on a uh, playground swing. You've got a 200-pound father who's being pushed on the swing by a 7-year-old kid. And in a surprisingly short amount of time, that 7-year-old has his 200-pound father going 2 or 3 feet in the air. 7-year-old can lift 200 pounds? Yeah. Only by pushing repeatedly. And terribly important to that, pushing at the right time. So when the father comes back, if they push at just the right time, they add to their motion. A little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. They go a little higher, they come back. A little higher, they come back. A little higher, they come back. We're doing that 440 times a second. Now, I can add inertia to this tuning fork. So these are just two little plastic clamps. That's more mass. That's more inertia. That means that these clamps are harder to change what they're doing. So instead of bouncing 440 times a second, they're going to be maybe 420. Right? They're not quite as many. So let's bring that over here. No. This guy does not care. 
Why? Because the little kid is pushing his father at the wrong time. So just as he comes back, you push before he gets to the top of his travel, which means your push slows him down instead of speeding him up. Okay? And so only when things are matched does this work. We call this resonance. And of course it's got a lot to do with musical instruments. If you play musical instruments, you're very much aware that if somebody plays a note, your instrument may pick that note up. This phenomenon is also important in math and science and terribly important in engineering. So we're going to take a look at a situation where they didn't learn it until after the problem. So in 1940, they put a suspension bridge in south of the city of Seattle, Washington. It was a big, important bridge, but very soon after they built it, it started doing this. So this is basically a big, long strip of stuff. The wind is blowing sideways across it. This is not terribly unlike a wind instrument, something like a clarinet. This is a reed. If we move air over a reed, if we build things correctly, the reed vibrates. This reed started vibrating. Okay? They hadn't planned on making a clarinet. They were hoping it was a bridge. But let's see what happens. As a reporter on the Tacoma News Bureau, I had come to watch the bridge. I drove on to the bridge and started across. In the car with me was my daughter's cocker spaniel, Tubby. Not until I reached the first tower did I realize that something was terribly wrong. <laughs> I drove past the towers, the bridge began to sway violently from side to side. I lost control of the car. I jammed on the brakes and got out of the car, only to be thrown onto my face against the curb. Around me, I could hear concrete cracking. I started back to the car to get the dog, but I was thrown before I could reach it. The car itself began to slide from side to side on the roadway. I decided the bridge was breaking up. My only hope was to get back to shore. I crawled 500 yards or more to the towers. My knees were raw and bruised. My hands were swollen from gripping the concrete curb. But I was spurred on by the thought that if I could reach the towers, I would be safe. I made an effort during a momentary decrease in the violence of the bridge motion to reach the car. But the car began to shift about in a most alarming manner. While I was out on this portion of the span, I took the opportunity to examine the state of the bridge. As far as the eye and ear could detect, the oscillations were causing no distress in the girder. Then, as I was starting along the outside edge of the bridge, I saw a distinct break in the steel eye beam. From this point on, failure occurred so rapidly that observation was difficult and impressive fact were somewhat missed. A whole section fell out of the bridge. After this first section fell, the whole bridge, almost at once, ceased its violent twisting motion and fell into a much easier vertical motion. The failure became progressive along the main span, the shock of each successive unloading of the main span producing a corresponding shock in the side span from which I was attempting to make observations. Two of these shocks were of sufficient force as to throw me violently to the deck. Those who stood on the shore and watched the bridge in its death agony still can have no conception of the violence of movement felt by one out beyond the towers. Safely back at the toll plaza, I saw the bridge at its final collapse and saw my car plunge into the narrow. Hey. 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 I believe that right at this minute what appalls me most is that within a few hours I must tell my daughter that her dog is dead. When I might have saved her. See, you thought paying attention in science was like optional. You guys who don't pay attention in science classes are killing dogs. <laughs> if this guy paid attention, Puppy would be alive today. Well, I feel bad. He would be alive. Okay. Why can you go to the shore next summer and not be scared to death about the Ben Franklin and the Walt Whitman Bridge? Now that you've seen this. Don't these look like the Ben Franklin and the Walt Whitman? Well, yes, they do. They've got these cables. That means they're suspension bridges. But there really is a difference. 
the side of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, and this was a new idea in 1940, was the solid steel plates. Those solid plates were a very good structural idea, but a bad aerodynamic idea. And so they weren't thinking that the wind was something to worry about. But the wind blew sideways, the sidewalls blocked the airflow, and so they ended up with low pressure on the far side. The wind's blowing this way, there's a hollow space back there, the air alternately fills in from above and below the bridge. It turned out by tragic accident, that the rate at which the bridge was ready to bounce matched the rate at which the air was switching from top to bottom. It was a resonance phenomenon and the bridge began to vibrate. They actually had figured that out. They had steel plates on the shore. They were going to hang cables down and put the steel plates horizontally in the water. So as the bridge tried to rock, the steel plates would slosh and take the energy away but the wind hit the right speed before they got them in place and the bridge came down. They have since replaced the bridge and here is the new Tacoma Narrows Bridge as proven by the fact that when we take the picture Mount Rainier is in the background in Washington State. And notice the new design has got open truss work. If you look at the Ben Franklin and Walt Whitman bridges you will find open truss work. This open truss work lets the air flow through takes the whole aerodynamic behavior out of the picture, and the Ben Franklin Bridge has been there for 90 years doing just fine, and my suspicion is that for the five minutes it takes you to get across it, it will continue to be fine. Okay, so we don't really have to worry too much about it. Um, but we would like to take a look at a resonant phenomenon that we can afford to do. You know, I was tempted to see if we could knock down the new South Street Bridge, but they only recently got it in there and they'd be very upset if we were to wreck it. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a wine glass. Now, I'll bet most of you have taken advantage of the resonance of a wine glass but didn't use the right words. Your parents probably said you were an annoying brat. <laughs> so you're at dinner, you're bored, you dip your finger in your water glass, you run it around the top, it goes, yeah. 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 Stop that! Stop that! You're embarrassing me! Okay? The sound that that makes is the resonant frequency of the glass. So, we have gone out and purchased water glasses at Target, we spared no expense, we waited for sale. Okay, so they're about a buck a piece. Now, we would like to find out at what sound they make noise. So, so this is a vibration of a thousand cycles a second in this container. This gadget here is a horn driver from basically a rock music sound system that would be behind the musician. Okay, we got about 100 watts of sound. We're not using that now. Somewhere between 900 and 1,000 vibrations a second, this glass starts to shake. It turns out that the human eye does not report that well. As you're aware, videos are 30 frames a second, and they do that because if we change something more than about 20 times a second, the human eye blurs it into one thing. Okay, so the video looks smooth. So a thousand times a second, you're going to see nothing. So we're putting a ping pong ball in there because when this guy bounces, even though we can't see it bounce, the ping pong ball's got to get out of the way. So the ping pong ball is now going to start moving when the glass moves. So at a thousand cycles a second, nothing. So we're going to bring this down a little bit. Now, I'm only changing pitch. I'm not changing volume. Wow. 
loud, but it certainly gets less effective because the glass can't do that. The glass can only shake at one speed, like my tuning fork. We shatter it. So let's go back to where it shakes. Shatter it. Yeah. Shatter it. Vibrations a second. Now we would like to break this glass. Yes. 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 Phoenix Pete has taken the ping pong ball out of the glass. Why? Why have we taken the ping pong ball out of the glass? And why would that be? Okay? Exactly right. We would more technically say taking some of the energy. Okay? So with the ping pong ball in there, the energy we're delivering to the glass is being transferred to the ping pong ball. The ping pong ball would save the glass, very much like the metal plates under the bridge would have saved the bridge. If there's somewhere for the energy to go, it takes it away from the vibration. Now, the other thing we would like to do is let you see the vibration. You can't see 955 vibrations a second. But Donna Summer left us her strobe light. Okay? So, we've got a strobe light. If I have this strobe light vibrate 955 times a second, every time the glass wiggles, you will see it in the same place. It will look stationary. We don't want that. That doesn't show you anything. But if we have the strobe light a little too slow, when the glass gets to the maximum movement, the light comes on and we see it. The glass comes down, it gets to its maximum movement, the light's not on yet. The light's a little late, the glass goes past it, comes down here, and then the light comes on. So we see this as a slow motion movie. It's here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. It's here. So if the strobe is just a little delayed, we can watch the glass move. So let's see if we can see that. Like a coat hanger, and like the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, if we flex something enough times, the material fatigues. And when it fatigues, it fails. So let's see what happens if we bring this up. brocaded curtains up and things like that that soak up sound. So hopefully you only have sound coming from the stage and you don't have echoes coming from the wall. So that's what I would guess. And it would turn out each person would have a different experience because each person gets the reflections at a slightly different time. Okay? So that's about it. Uh, thank you very much.
should be around front, so make sure you're getting on your bus with your chaperone. Do not get on the bus without your chaperone.